Hi everybody, nice to see you uh, joining us tonight for this webinar on vaping tobacco and your child. Certainly a very um, topical subject at the moment, everywhere we go. So I'd like to formally welcome you. My name is Sharon Healy. I'm the president of the Australian Council of State School Organisations. And before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognise that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also recognise that the traditional owners of their lands where you're gathered and the First Nations people who may be present in this webinar. I pay my respect to all elders past, and present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. So I'm thrilled to host this webinar for the Australian Council of State School Organisations and the ACT Cancer Council. Today we gather for a critical and informative discussion on vaping, tobacco and your child. This event represents a significant effect pardon me, effort to address an increasingly pressuring, pressing issue that threatens the health and wellbeing of our younger generation. We are proud to partner with the Council Council ACT to further our commitment to improving public health with a particular focus on issues that impact young people. Today, we are honoured to have a speaker with us who has devoted her academic and professional pursuits to the cause of public health, specifically in regard to the wellbeing of young minds. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sophie Dyson. Sophie is a highly motivated individual with a bachelor's degree in public health and a master's advanced that she's about to complete. Her passion lies in identifying and addressing public health issues that affect young people. She has diverse interests across these issues, including in drugs and alcohol, mental health, disordered internet use, and promoting healthy lifestyles. Sophie is currently working with the Cancer Council ACT Prevention Team, where she has conducted extensive research on vaping in young people. Her work is focused on determining the factors that influence e-cigarette use, and she's also explored the critical role that parents can play in preventing and stopping e-cigarette use in adolescents. Sophie's dedication to unravelling the complexities of this issue and her commitment to developing strategies for a healthier future make her an invaluable resource for our discussion today. Her insights will illuminate our challenges and most importantly, guide us towards effective solutions. Without any further ado, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Sophie Dyson. We're excited to hear from you, Sophie, and learn from your wealth of knowledge and expertise in this critical conversation. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sophie, and on behalf of the Cancer Council ACT, I would like to thank the Australian Council of State Schools Organisation for their collaboration in the creation of this webinar. It will be available on their website and our website for future viewing, or if you would like to recommend it to others. Today, we will be discussing vaping, tobacco, and your child. Some of the information and statistics which we cover in this presentation are specific to teenagers aged 14 to 17, but the vast majority is applicable to children of all ages. Unfortunately, we simply do lack the data and adequate research on vaping in children who are younger than this. Before we begin, I would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land that I'm giving this presentation from, the Ngunnawal people, I would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land which you may be watching from. I would like to extend my respect to the traditional custodians of Ngunnawal country, elders past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be present here today. As I hope to share knowledge with you all today, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to knowledge sharing in this country. Before we get into the content, I would like to make sure that everyone has filled out the pre-questionnaire which was attached with the registration. If you haven't filled out that questionnaire, please do so now. The information you provide is critical for us to make sure that we're delivering effective presentations which help parents and caregivers like yourself to help your children. At the end of the presentation, we will also have a post questionnaire, which helps to tell us whether you found the presentation useful and educational. I will let you know when it's time to fill that out. Throughout the duration of this presentation, you will have your cameras and your microphones turned off. We do ask that if you have any questions, 
you put these in the chat function and we will answer these at the end of the presentation. We will also have additional information and resources which will be shared following the presentation. You will likely need to have your phone nearby as there are some QR codes during the presentation. The links will also be posted in the chat for those who do not have access to their phone. So just a brief overview of what we will be covering today. First, we will look at the background information on e-cigarettes and then discuss some of the policies and legislation on e-cigarettes. Next, we'll move into some of the key statistics and talk a bit more specifically about e-cigarette use in children. After that, we'll chat about what you can actually do to help. And finally, I'll provide some additional resources for perusal. So first, we'll look at the background information on e-cigarettes. To start with, we're going to do a bit of a mini history lesson showing the evolution of tobacco cigarettes to e-cigarettes. So in the 1890s, cigarettes were mass produced inexpensively for the first time. And in 1920, the First World War transformed the way in which people consumed tobacco. More than 50% of tobacco consumption was now cigarette smoking. In 1945, in Australia, 75% of men and 25% of women were regular cigarette smokers. In the 1960s, Victoria ran the first quit smoking campaign. It utilised prominent footballers to encourage people to stop smoking. In the 1970s, most cigarettes began to contain filters. Additionally, smoking education started in Australian schools. In the 1980s, all Australian states were running social marketing campaigns on the harmful nature of smoking, and bans on public smoking began to be implemented across Australia. In the 1990s, the minimum age for purchase of cigarettes was raised 18, and the large text warnings on packages were introduced. Smoke-free policies also became a lot more common across the country. Moving on to the past two decades. So in 2003, the first commercial e-cigarette was created in Beijing. In 2006, electronic cigarettes were introduced to Australia, Europe, and the USA. And in the same year, graphic health warnings were introduced to Australian cigarette packets. In 2008, the World Health Organization declared that the e-cigarette was not considered a legitimate smoking cessation aid. In January 2009, Australia banned the possession and sale of e-cigarettes containing nicotine. In 2012, Australia introduced their plain packaging laws for tobacco cigarettes. And from 2014 to 2018, Australia undertook a number of parliamentary inquiries into e-cigarettes. In June of 2020, Australia banned the import of nicotine-containing vapour products without physician prescription. And finally, in 2023, the government promised greater restrictions to e-cigarettes. We'll be discussing these changes a little bit more detailed later in the talk. Many of you might not be very familiar with what a vape actually looks like. So this is quite a standard vape in a common brand which has been taken apart. It contains a battery, which is blue and can be seen in the centre of the image. It also contains a mouthpiece, which is black and is in the bottom right of the image. And it contains a cartridge, which contains the e-liquid, which is yellow, and can be seen at the top of the image. There is a huge range of vaping products on the market, but what do children actually use? The children mostly vape disposable vapes, which contain nicotine and feature flavours. Australian children show a strong preference for nicotine vapes, and this is especially true of those who also smoke traditional cigarettes. Some children do use refillable vapes, but this is rare. Disposable vapes with nicotine are more commonly used because they're easier to find and they are actually cheaper than nicotine-free or refillable vapes. Children do not exhibit brand preferences when it comes to e-cigarette choice. Essentially, they will vape what they can get. As you can see, e-cigarettes come in an extremely wide array of colours and styles. My recommendation is that if you find something and you aren't sure if it is an e-cigarette, Google any brands or words which are featured on the device. Most will have at least a brand name. 
it's quite important to understand what is actually happening in our bodies when one uses an e-cigarette. So within an e-cigarette, the e-liquid or the vape juice is heated and vaporized and is inhaled by the user. It enters into the lungs first and is absorbed into the bloodstream. Once the harmful chemicals from smoking or vaping are in our bloodstream, they rapidly travel around our body to our organs, including the brain. The evidence on e-cigarettes and its effect on e-health is still evolving, but these are some of the known dangers which are associated with vaping. The first is dependence and abuse, and this is especially true for those who don't smoke, but do vape. The next are adverse respiratory health outcomes. So we know that there are acute, meaning short-term negative effects on lung health, and these can be identified within the first half hour to two hours after someone uses an e-cigarette. We know that e-cigarettes can lead to burns and injuries, we know that these can be quite severe and have resulted in death. Burns and injuries are of particular concern in children as we know that they are tampering with disposable vapes. Recent studies found that 10% of vapes confiscated from New South Wales school children were found to have been tampered with. This leads into the next known danger, which is poisoning. So exposure to nicotine e-liquids can lead to poisoning and the use of e-cigarettes can result in nicotine toxicity. Research has found an association between vaping and adverse neurological outcomes, and this includes seizures. There are also a number of environmental hazards associated with vaping, including increased airborne particulate matter when used indoors, and also fires and environmental waste. E-cigarette use is associated with a number of less serious adverse effects as well, including dizziness, throat irritation, coughing, nausea, and headaches. The significant importance is that vaping is associated with increased rates of smoking uptake. So never smokers who use e-cigarettes are three times more likely to take up smoking. Additionally, non-smokers are those who have quit smoking who use e-cigarettes are three times more likely to relapse and become current cigarette smokers. Over 200 distinct chemicals have been found in e-cigarettes and their aerosols. Some of these we know are harmful and some we are still in the process of researching. I will let you know about a couple of them now. So allyl alcohol is found in common household cleaning products and disinfectants. Arsenic is a highly poisonous chemical historically used in rat poison. Cadmium is a toxic heavy metal found in batteries. Formaldehyde is commonly used to preserve dead bodies. Lead is a highly dangerous toxic metal, which is found in aviation fuel, ammunition, and batteries. So how much nicotine is in an e-cigarette? One e-cigarette can contain as much nicotine as one or even two packets of traditional cigarettes. E-cigarettes, which contain a 20 milligram per litre concentration of nicotine, are the most equivalent to tobacco cigarettes. We know that if someone is getting through a 6,000 puff e-cigarette in two weeks, they're consuming the equivalent of about four cigarettes per day. The point is that it really does depend upon individual use and the specific nicotine content of the device. Nicotine consumption can be affected by absorption of nicotine and the duration and depth of puff that users take. As a lot of the vapes in Australia are illegally imported, they could contain more nicotine than a packet of cigarettes. And there's really no way of us knowing this. In this section, we will discuss the policies and legislations around e-cigarette use in Australia. E-cigarettes have not been approved as safe or effective by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. This means that e-cigarette liquid may not be labelled properly or safely packaged. That means that e-liquid and e-cigarettes, which are labelled nicotine-free, are still likely to contain nicotine. So one study found that up to 60% of nicotine-free labelled e-cigarettes were still found to contain nicotine. A separate study which looked at e-cigarettes which were seized by New South Wales police or were confiscated from Sydney students 
found that 98% of them contained nicotine. Some devices shed heavy metals due to poor manufacturing controls. Some flavoring chemicals break down over time and when heated, create an unknown chemical mix. Additionally, flavorings have not been tested for inhalation safety, and we know that some of them can cause DNA damage. First, we will discuss the current legislation for children under the age of 18. So the use of tobacco cigarettes and e-cigarettes are banned in government schools around Australia. States may have their own unique policies with more information about school-sponsored events off campus. Independent schools may also have their own policies. To know more about different limitations on school boundaries, information for school-sponsored events, and information about school-specific policies, please contact your child's school. It is illegal in Australia to sell a vape to anyone under the age of 18. There are several retailers who do sell vapes to young people, and this is a crime. If you do suspect that someone is selling vapes to minors, you can report it to Access Canberra or to your relevant state department. Looking at the current rules for adults, it's illegal to sell nicotine-containing vapes to anyone. It is illegal to use vapes in non-smoking areas, and you can currently purchase nicotine-free e-cigarettes from retail stores. But a lack of regulation and enforcement means that it is likely that these do contain nicotine. Changes in the legislation around vaping were proposed in 2023. Essentially, only reusable nicotine-containing e-cigarettes, which are prescribed by a GP and purchased from a pharmacy, will be allowed. It will still be illegal to use e-cigarettes in non-smoking areas. There will be no retail sales of any recreational e-cigarettes, and e-cigarettes will essentially be treated as medication. With these changes, children under the age of 18 will be unable to access e-cigarettes as quit smoking support. This means that other forms of cessation for children are increasingly important. We will discuss smoking and vaping cessation for children later in the talk. Now we will look at some of the key statistics and data which is available on e-cigarette use in Australian children. Research prepared for the Australian Health Department by Cancer Council Victoria looked at smoking and vaping trends in 14 to 17 year olds from 2018 to 2022. They found that smoking rates in this age group had risen for the first time in over 20 years. They also showed a significant increase in vaping rates between this time period. Additionally, the dual use of smoking and vaping increased significantly between 2018 and 2022. The research also shows a really strong link between vaping and children picking up smoking. So non-smokers who vape are three times as likely to start smoking. This connection is unique to vaping. So we don't see the same connection in children who drink alcohol or who use illicit drugs. Australian children typically pick up vaping and then may progress to smoking. The 2017 Australian Secondary Schools Students Alcohol and Drugs Survey reported that 65% of the students surveyed who had used e-cigarettes had also used tobacco cigarettes. That same survey found that children who smoked cigarettes were 13 times as likely to have also used e-cigarettes. For those of you who might be interested, the results of the 2022 Australian Secondary School Students Alcohol and Drug Survey will be released next year in 2024. Generation Vape is a study led by Cancer Council New South Wales in collaboration with a number of government and non-government organisations. Their survey of New South Wales 14 to 17 year olds found that 35% of surveyed students had tried vaping. 70% of those who had vaped started before the age of 16. 51% of those who had vaped used a vape knowing that it contained nicotine. And 35% of those who had not vaped were considered to be susceptible to vaping. We will now look closer at e-cigarette use in children. 
It can be really tempting to think of vaping in adolescence as either my child vapes or my child doesn't vape. But in reality, it is a little bit more of a continuum. In an ideal world, all children would be resilient non-vapers, but we just know that this isn't the case. The resilient non-vapers are characterized by having a strong sense of self, a select group of friends, and being unlikely to give in to social pressure. They are not curious about vaping and see it as unhealthy, addictive, and irresponsible. They are unlikely to engage with other addictive behaviors, and they likely have strategies in place to target peer pressure. When we talk about vulnerable non-vapers, this is the same as the susceptible vapors from the New South Wales Generation Vape Research, where they found that 35% of adolescents aged 14 to 17 who don't vape are curious about vaping. This group tends to skew a little bit younger, and they are likely to feel overwhelmed or uncomfortable if they're offered a vape. They might be able to say no in a small social situation, but are unlikely to be able to say no in larger group settings. They do see vaping as harmful and addictive, and they don't typically engage in other risky behaviours, but they might be persuaded to through peer pressure. With those who do vape, there are opportunistic vapors who may have started vaping due to curiosity or peer pressure. They're unlikely to turn down a vape, but are also unlikely to actively seek them out. They tend to self-moderate their use due to fear of addiction. They like to push some boundaries and engage in some risky behavior, but are not reckless. This group also tends to skew a little bit younger. Committed vapors are in a brief transitory stage. They've recently purchased their own vape, and this is often with the intent of sharing it. They vape mostly socially and maybe the ones passing the vape around. They might vape solo, typically at home to relax. They are trying to manage their use, but the ubiquity of vapes and their increased dependency makes it quite difficult. They do view vaping as unhealthy and addictive, but also have positive expectancies around social outcomes and may view it as calming. Dependent vapors are addicted to nicotine and use e-cigarettes as they believe it helps with stress relief. They vape at least every day and always have their vape on them. Some may leave class to vape or may vape in class. Many vape as soon as they wake up, which is a high indicator of dependency. Many also own multiple vapes. They are likely to end, spend significant amounts of money on vaping. Most children who are dependent on vaping are aware of this fact, but they find it too hard to cut back or quit. Children in this segment are likely to discourage people from taking up vaping, but would still share a vape with other known vapors. Children use e-cigarettes for a wide variety of reasons, but by far the most common reason is out of curiosity. Some of the other reasons include product characteristics, such as tasty flavors, easier concealability, and the ability to do vape tricks. Family and friend use, including peer pressure or friends and family sharing devices. Children might also be trying to replace cigarettes. It's important to remember that lots of children have very positive perceptions of vaping. They think that it might make them cool or popular, and at least part of this has to do with the fact that 63% of vaping videos on TikTok portray vaping positively. They also think that it helps with mental health. Lastly, children use e-cigarettes because the chemicals make it feel good. Looking again at the Generation Vape research, when children aged 14 to 17 in New South Wales were asked how easy it was to get a vape. 82% of them said it would be easy for them to get a vape. When asked where they get e-cigarettes, there was a pretty wide range of responses, including both in-person and online options. This included retail, family and friends, and social media.
Looking at the most common places children report getting e-cigarettes, of young people aged 14 to 17, 47% of them bought their vapes through retail stores, 39% brought through a family, friend, someone else or a dealer, and 14% bought through social media. In terms of buying an e-cigarette online, many of the sites that we looked at, it was as easy as just clicking a button to say you were over the age of 18. The price of e-cigarettes range and are dependent on the number of puffs or the size of the vape. Of children and getting the vape delivered to them, it costs an additional five to ten dollars. If they are ordering from an online vape shop, shipping is likely to be free if they are ordering over a specific threshold, which is typically around seventy-five dollars. Or if they're ordering below this threshold, then shipping ranges, but is typically around eight to ten dollars. If you have ever seen a weird Facebook Marketplace advertisement for fruit, they are typically selling vapes. Looking at where children vape, this typically varies by age. The children in lower high school tend to vape in hidden places away from adults, whereas upper high schoolers vape more openly. The places that children vape range wildly, school toilets and change rooms, shopping centers, parks, train and bus stations, parties, alleyways and behind buildings are all indications. By far the most common question we get asked is what can I do? So we're going to go into some evidence-based advice about parenting and e-cigarettes. The most important thing to keep in mind is that children are at a developmental stage where it is appropriate and normal for them to want to take risks. That being said, there are some things which research suggests might help prevent or delay smoking and vaping in children. So we will discuss those now. Authoritative parenting might sound really scary, but it really just refers to enforcing appropriate rules and boundaries with your child while showing an interest in them, caring for and about them, and encouraging them. Parental monitoring refers to parents being involved with their kids, spending time with them, and supervising them. This includes having dinner together, knowing where your kids are when they aren't with you, and knowing who their close friends are. It is important to consider the amount of pocket money that you give your child. Studies have shown that pocket money more than $60 has been linked with higher incidence of vaping. Having well-timed conversations with teens about the risks and harms of smoking and vaping have been shown to be effective. So ideally, you want to have a relaxed and easygoing approach to these conversations. They should be respectful and constructive. We will talk a little bit more about this next, and there will also be links at the end which are provided to help. You should have firm rules around smoking and vaping, which are agreed upon and discussed. This should ideally include the consequences which will follow if the rules are broken. We know the total ban on smoking for everyone in the household all the time has been shown to be effective in reducing smoking in young people. And this includes if you or another family member smoke. We know that smoking prevention and cessation for children is most effective when coming from family members or trusted adults who don't smoke. So if you smoke but a close trusted adult does not, it might be worth getting them to have a chat with your child as well. Talking to children about smoking and vaping is really, really important, but it can be very daunting. Hopefully this presentation has given you a lot of new information about smoking, vaping and your child. If you need more information or you want to check a, chat, a fact which you've heard, there will be plenty of resources available for perusal later in the talk. Ideally, in your talk, you should be discussing the negative consequences of vaping and smoking talking about strategies to resist peer pressure. You should be encouraging non-smoking behavior. And you should also ideally be reiterating your rules about smoking. You should have your talk in a neutral location. This might include a coffee shop, a dog park, the living room, or on the car ride home from school. 
you don't want to be talking where you can be interrupted and you don't want to talk to them in their or your bedroom. Ideally, we want to make sure that we're in the right headspace for a chat and that our child is as well. We want to be open and honest. We want to show interest, ask open-ended questions, let our children talk, listen with patience and convey our expectations. It's really important to be ready to seize the moment. Did an anti-vaping campaign come on the radio? Is someone vaping nearby? Did you read an article or see something about vaping in the news, which could be used to spark a conversation? Any of these would be a good catalyst for approaching the conversation from a neutral and non-accusatory angle. Habits and triggers are something that your child will need to understand on their quit journey. They need to understand and reflect on when and why they vape. This might be something that they want to discuss, but most likely it will be something that they need to do themselves. What you can do for them is encourage that reflection. A why is the reason that an individual wants to quit vaping or smoking. It is highly personal and it varies wildly depending on the individual. Again, this might be something your child is willing to discuss or it might be something that they want to keep private. What you can do is you can provide examples. So some people quit to improve their health, their relationships, their sleep, their feelings of addiction and dependence or to save money. It needs to be something that is relevant to them and to be something that they care about. Setting a quit date means that your child picks a date within the next fortnight to quit. You can help by ensuring that their quit date is full of activities which you know that they will love and which will keep them distracted. The night before the quit date, your child should detox by throwing away any cigarette or vapes and any associated paraphernalia. Building a quit plan might help them. You should help your child understand the signs of withdrawal and let them know that if they are experiencing withdrawal, that they can speak with a GP, pharmacist, or the quit line to discuss accessing medication. Discussing withdrawal in advance will help your child feel more prepared. You can talk about what triggers are with your child and help them identify which situations are likely to be triggering to them. This could include specific times of the day, such as when they wake up or when they get home from school, or it could include specific scenarios like parties. Helping your child to think ahead and plan what to do and say in specific scenarios will be helpful to them. They can use the four Ds in triggering scenarios. Delay, deep breathing, do something else, and drink water. Helping your child understand replacement strategies may also help them quit. So replacement strategies are things that your child can do to help them overcome a trigger. It might include taking a sip from a drink, chewing on gum or using mints, brushing their teeth, holding a pen or fidget in the hand they use to vape. Feel free to get creative. Anything that your child thinks would work is worth trying. Helping your child to make positive routine changes will help them on their quit journey. This includes if your child used to vape as soon as they woke up, helping them swap out that behavior. You might suggest they take a shower when they wake up or that they go for a walk. You could indicate that they could have breakfast before heading to school. If they used to vape as soon as they got home from school, you could suggest that they talk to you or their friends to take their mind off of it. You could also suggest they read a book or go for a walk to relax. Again, this will need to be things that your teen genuinely wants to do and thinks will work. Take their suggestions. They likely know themselves. Get your child in touch with the available and relevant services to help them. I will let you know some possible options a little bit later in the talk. So these are some really practical examples of how we can use the existing research to act. So we know that children who vape overestimate the prevalence of vaping. It might be helpful to remind them that most children and adults don't actually vape. We know that children are curious about the cigarette equivalency of vaping 
and that knowing this might help deter them from vaping as they know that smoking is harmful. We can help to increase their awareness of how many cigarettes which vape use represents. So something handy is keeping in mind what we shared earlier, where an e-cigarette contain as much can contain as much nicotine as one or even two packs of cigarettes. And then we can't really be sure how much nicotine we are consuming due to the lack of re regulation. It's important to remember that the trust, the opinions of trusted adults matter to many children. We can use this by voicing our disapproval of vaping to the children who we are close to. We also know that the affordability and ease of access of e-cigarettes are significant enablers for children. You should try to be on top of how your children spend their money. And additionally, if you use an e-cigarette, you should hide them appropriately. Continuing on with how we can use the evidence, we know that children perceive different harms based on variables such as the perceived quality of vapes and nicotine versus non-nicotine vapes. It's important to emphasize to children that all vapes are harmful and that we cannot be certain whether vapes contain nicotine due to the lack of regulation. We know that children do not want to develop or exacerbate mental health issues, so it might be helpful to remind them of the negative mental health impacts caused by nicotine dependence and the improvements in mental health which are witnessed after people quit smoking or vaping. Research shows that children feel uncomfortable knowing that they are breathing in harmful chemicals when vaping, so educating them around what chemicals are found in e-cigarettes and their typical use might provide a deterrent. When communicating with children about vaping, we want to be making it sound and look like young people's content. We want to use their language, we want to empathize with them and understand their perspectives. Ideally, we can utilize available stories from other young people, which highlight the harms of vaping. It can be really helpful for children to practice dealing with peer pressure. On the screen are some examples of phrases children can use to decline when offered a vape or to explain why they are not vaping if they have quit. Role playing the scenario or preparing in advance for peer pressure will help them recall what to do in the moment. For instance, they might practice the phrase, I don't want to try vaping because it's basically smoking, or I'm not vaping anymore because it makes me feel sick now. Self-efficacy is a really important belief for your kids to have, especially within the context of vaping and smoking. Kids need to believe that they are able to not smoke or vape in the first place, believe that they can quit if they have started smoking or vaping, and believe that they can change their social environment for the better. When interacting with your child, in order to build their self-efficacy, you should highlight their unique strengths and successes to provide optimism and support, help them set goals which are achievable, help them plan for their goals to set them up for success, and help them out if they ask you. Executive functioning and self-regulation skills are the mental processes which enable us to plan, focus attention, remember instructions, and multitask. The brain needs the skill set to filter distractions, prioritize tasks, set and achieve goals and control impulses. Children develop and improve their executive functioning through goal setting, planning and monitoring, self-monitoring, and engaging with activities like sports, yoga, music, theater, or gaming, and through studying and completing school tasks. You can help by guiding them through these activities. Higher levels of executive functioning have been linked with reduced incidence of smoking and vaping in children. And parents play a really critical role in helping children develop these skills. The big five executive functioning skills are impulse control, planning and decision making, concentration, memory, and emotional regulation. More information on how you can help kids develop these skills will be available in the resources at the end of the talk. It's really important to know that help is out there. This is far from an exhaustive list, and believe me when I say that everyone is working on developing the best possible resources to curb the rise in vaping and smoking in children. 
So the quit line provides smoking and vaping cessation support. This is a really big one to keep in mind as the government continues to crack down on the availability of e-cigarettes, as children will likely need cessation support. Your local GP is a great source of information and assistance with quitting. Headspace has some information available on smoking and vaping through their website. They also provide mental health help, which is critical, as many children use e-cigarettes as a means of self-medicating due to false positive perceptions of vaping. The Kids Helpline is another resource which provides support to kids dealing with mental health concerns and also dealing with peer pressure around smoking, drugs and alcohol. Health Direct is run by the Australian government and provides excellent and concise information on e-cigarettes and a host of other issues. The Alcohol and Drug Foundation has great information on alcohol and other drugs and also provides great resources for parents, carers and health workers. Their information about vaping and youth fits really nicely with this presentation. Generation Vape is run by Cancer Council New South Wales and again provides excellent information on vaping, specifically in young people. If you are looking more generally for all things Australian parenting, Parents Australia has great information on a variety of different topics. Here is a selection of helpful resources, which might provide a good next step if you still have questions or want to learn more about what we have discussed. My colleague Alex will post these in the Teams chat for your perusal. There are a huge range of available resources, and all of the ones that I have highlighted are evidence-based and are well worth reading, in my opinion. Our final research resource is the ACT Health Vaping Course. ACT Health has created a two-hour TQI accredited course to educate teachers of students in years seven and eight. The course also includes a parent resource with key facts about vaping, health impacts, and conversation starters. The course is available to be taken by the wider public, and I found it to be really well done and informative. So if you are interested, you can access it via the QR code. Even if you're not in the ACT, I would absolutely still recommend giving it a look as the information is still mostly applicable to the broader Australian context. I'd like to ask that you all complete the post questionnaire. So this really helps us to know whether you found the talk today interesting, what you thought and what you understood. It also helps us to improve the webinar for future presentations. I'll keep the QR code on the screen so that people can respond to the questionnaire and hopefully we'll have some questions posted in the chat. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sophie, for all that. So much information there, lots of statistics, <laughs> many of them very worrying and shocking. Um, Perhaps other people were aware of some of the uh, rates of vaping in our young people. I certainly wasn't aware. Um, how easy it is for them to to obtain vapes as well. Yeah. Um, we might just go, if anybody has any questions that they'd like, do you want to pop them in the chat and we can have a look at them as we go? Um, Peter, I might ask you if, if anything pops up that you could read it out, please. I'll do. Thank you. So I'll give people a, a couple of minutes to get typing if that's what they'd like to do. Um, so you've given us some great info and places to get resources as parents to help um, either prevent our young people from starting using e-cigarettes or to quit. Um, do we need to be working with government about the restrictions that are obviously not being imposed? If you know primary school children can go into a convenience store or a, a candy store or whatever and buy vapes off the shelf, like we know it's illegal to sell it to them, and yet you know your statistics say how many can just go buy them themselves at, in person or online. So do we need to be targeting or expecting our governments to be targeting the sellers? So we do have a lot of a lot of information coming out that. Governments are actually trying really hard to crack down on the black market of e-cigarette sales in Australia. 
But the issue is that it is far more profitable for stores to continue to sell e-cigarettes and just cop the fines. Um, That's horrific. So, yeah, it is. It's it's terrible. Yeah. Um, in terms of the new legislation coming out, it should really help to crack down on the number of children, especially getting e-cigarettes, as it makes them a pharmacy medication rather than something that can be purchased over the counter. And that will mean that, you know, all of your tobacconists, all of the the corner stores should not have any vaping products moving forwards and won't be selling them to children or adults. And, and that would be great, but given that they're not supposed to do it now <laughs> to mm -hmm. anyone with a, with a vape that contains nicotine, and as you say, probably most of them do, whether we know that or not, yes. um, what's the, the reality of that ceasing the black market be interesting to see statistically Definitely. if it does help at all. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the problem is that unfortunately Australia doesn't exist in a black hole um, and there's always going to be access to products that are made overseas that can be imported illegally um, and that's not something absolutely. that we expect to see stop. Um, but definitely we are looking at making it harder and hopefully the government's legislation will make it more difficult um, moving forwards. Yeah, that would be great. And, and you know, perhaps if um, the financial cost, if you are found to be doing the wrong thing in, in selling them, will be a lot higher than it currently is. If it's, you know, as you said, more profitable to just keep selling them and cop a fine every now and again, that fine needs to be hugely increased, I would expect. Um, yeah, so, yeah. We haven't got any questions at the moment, but I have one, Sophie, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, looking at, and we've, Sharon briefly touched on this about addressing things at a societal level, but we had the issue of the quit smoking campaign a number of years ago, which seemed to work for a period of time. Um, but the cycle has come round again, where more young people are either vaping or smoking cigarettes. Do you think getting a, um, a campaign going similar to, and this is probably being a bit out there, the Grim Reaper campaign um, was is something that we need to be looking at to address it at that society level? Yeah, I mean, I think that social marketing campaigns have a huge potential to be really impactful in the space. Um, but obviously, these sort of things to be effective um, and to be worthwhile do require quite a huge amount of research um, before actually being implemented uh, so that we prevent um, issues like what we've seen in America where they produced a whole heap of quit vaping things targeted towards teenagers and teenagers when this is... Um, Silly, silly would probably be the word. Um, yeah, so we really need to make sure that if we are spending the money, because it is expensive to do behavioural social marketing campaigns, we do really need to make sure that they are going to be effective and as effective as we need them. Um, and it looks like at the moment what we're doing is we're going more that route where we're taking policy, policy first, and then potentially we will work on the social aspect of it a little bit later. That that makes sense to a degree, doesn't it? Because, you know, you've got to have the policies in place before you can do anything else. But um, that sort of campaign would be great and maybe we need to be smart and when we've got the, the evidence and the information, engage with young people to actually put the social media posts and campaigns together so that it's in the right language, as you were saying before, it's got to be in language that makes sense and is appealing to the, to the young kids. So that's probably um, one way to go. And I think like, surely if you highlighted all the chemicals that you listed before that are in them, some kids are going to go, hold on, no, that's just ridiculous. Why am I doing that? I think they quite possibly have no idea what's in there. 
Yeah, so we're absolutely finding that that is an issue. And actually, I believe that the Generation Vape people in New South Wales have come out with a campaign looking at, um, do you know what's in your vape? Um, and they are highlighting that there are really dangerous chemicals present in e-cigarette products. Um, and that campaign will be continuing into, I believe, June 2024. So definitely ongoing, Gosh. ongoing yeah. stuff. Um, we just haven't got, obviously, national social marketing campaigns. At, at this point, yes. Yeah. We'll see how that one goes, I guess. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the evaluation of that. It will. It will. Um, no questions, Sharon. No, no one has any questions? Well, we might say thank you very much you Sophie for joining us tonight and leading us through the discussion it's been really interesting and as I said very confronting and a bit scary um, to see that much use and and the availability I guess of of e-cigarettes just to um, the general public when they shouldn't be um, but thank you very very much and Sorry, Peter. Before you, no, sorry, Sharon, before you go, no. we've just had a question from Shane, uh, and that is, is there any data on a new cigarette store and increase on vape sales, cigarette sales in that area, people trying to quit slash school problems? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of when there is a higher concentration of vaping and cigarette stores in a location, we do see that typically smoking and vaping uh, rates in that location are higher. Um, and additionally, we do see that especially for people who have quit in the past or are attempting to quit, it is a lot more difficult for them to do so when there are significant numbers of tobacconists in the area. Um, in terms of school problems, we definitely do see that kids who smoke and vape do have higher incidences of school issues. Um, but in terms of the direction of that relationship, we don't really know whether it's because of smoking and vaping or whether it's because kids with school issues are more likely to turn to drugs. Yeah, that makes that. sense, doesn't it? Yeah, hopefully yeah. that answers. Yeah. Shane's question. Thank mm. you. All right, well, I hope everybody's done the pre and post questionnaires. So if you so should get some information on how you found this evening's webinar. Um, once again, I'd like to say thank you very much for being our guest tonight. And if you've got any feedback, please send it through. And, and there are resources, as Sophie said, that will be available post-conference, uh, post-webinar as well. All right, so thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Thanks, everyone.